Hello, everyone, and welcome to PointWise's first Let's Talk Meshing Live Q&A. Uh, we thank you all for joining us. You should be able to see uh, myself and Josh over here. Um, if you can't, be sure to let us know, but we do have our webcams on. You're just going to see our faces this entire time. So with that, uh, let me introduce us. Uh, my name is Travis Kerrigan. I'm the manager of business development here at PointWise, and I'm joined by Josh Dawson, our uh, senior applications engineer for PointWise. And together, uh, Josh and I are going to answer some of the questions that have been asked of us. Uh, we kind of put up a prompt on LinkedIn, uh, through email, and we got some responses. So we're going to go through those. We're going to try to keep this to about 15 minutes, and if you do have any other questions, you can always type them into the questions dialog box here in GoToWebinar, and if we have some time, we'll get to them. If not, we'll address them afterward. Uh, also, if you do think of any questions, uh, please feel free to, um, please feel free to uh, email us afterwards. So Fer Ferenga says already uh, that she can only see you, Josh. So hey. I, <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and do, better looking, better looking one, right? <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and uh, hide my webcam. In fact, we'll hide all. All right, good. Okay, we're back. It's kind of important that, uh, that I think you see both of us or else it's just going to be a black screen and it's not going to be any fun. <laughs> so, all right, th thank you both, uh, Uli and Ferangus, for, uh, for giving us some information on that. So, all right, well, with that, we're going to go ahead and get started. If you do like this format as well, let us know, and we can do more of these. Um, again, this is our first one, so we want to know if uh, this is a value of interest, and uh, if so, let us know, and we'll, we'll do some more. But let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so the first question that we have is, what are the most robust grid deformation techniques for structured grids? And this question is aimed at updating the volume grid for use in an adjoint optimization workflow. Um, so I'll go ahead and take this one. I'm familiar with uh, two that are very similar and two different tools as well. Um, one being SU2. Uh, which treats the mesh as an elastic solid and basically solves the linear elasticity equations for mesh movement. And you define like a freeform deformation box around the object of interest and the control points of this box become your design variables. And they smoothly, when these points move, the, uh, the mesh points inside on the surface and in the volume um, smoothly move throughout the computational domain. And so when you compute the adjoint and get your sensitivities, you can move these to kind of optimize your problem. Um, another one is a code called Sculptor by Optimal Solutions. Um, similarly, you define a box. It does the mesh morphing, but it does it outside the context of the solver in that it's kind of a framework for tying all of these tools together. You make a mesh, you run a simulation, that gets fed into Sculptor. Sculptor can do the mesh morphing, write out a new mesh, continue running uh, the simulation. And the... The differences, you know, are kind of on the meshing side. You know, solver side, the whether it's structured or unstructured doesn't really matter. You know, you're you're moving the points inside the computational domain. You're deforming the meshes, but when you have to go back to the mesher, let's say your deformation is severe enough that it inverts some elements or does something like that, and you need to do a remesh operation, that's where the difference between structured and unstructured comes in. So the prerequisite for all of this, obviously, is the highest quality initial mesh you can get, because that gives you the most latitude in your design optimization. But there are going to be cases where you need to do some local remeshing. So with a structured grid, the idea is if you're going to need to do some local remeshing and you have an idea of where the deformations are mostly going to happen, to block your mesh in such a way that you don't have any bounds of your topology, any block boundaries near the locations where you may need to do some remeshing operations. So if you can get those far enough away from those locations or design the topology in such a way that that localized change is much easier to, to go ahead and, and accomplish, then you're going to be in a, in a better situation. For unstructured, it's a little bit easier because you can often easily block um, an unstructured mesh in a way that you're isolating the area of interest so that you could quickly remesh that, that particular area if you need to. It's a really good question. Um, question number two that we have is, how to calculate the wall distance, let's say for a Y plus of one, in the case of a multi-phase problem such as ditching. 
the aircraft is going from air to water and maybe back to air again, a situation that I never want to be in. And the speed is also varying in time, but uh, let's go ahead and decouple the question and just focus on the aircraft ditching and going from air to water and back to air again. How would we calculate the wall distance, Josh? So give this question to the guy who doesn't like flying. It sounds like a terrible <laughs> situation to be in. Uh, but multi-phase phase flows are traditionally some of the more complicated flows uh, in CFD, uh, namely because the flow physics from one phase to another can be drastically different. So we recommend using the, the fluid that will produce the highest Reynolds number because consequently that will produce the smallest initial spacing. Uh, and actually you would use that spacing for both phases. Uh, you can use our Y plus calculator, which is found at www.pointwise.com forward slash Y plus, and that is Y P L U S. Uh, you'll put in uh, your uh, a few problem specific flow criteria like uh, free stream velocity, free stream density, uh, and your initial spacing will be calculated depending on whatever Y plus value you put in there, and uh, the Reynolds number will be calculated uh, based on flat plate theory. So uh, that's how you would do that. Cool. Thanks, Josh. And probably a good point to, to say that, you know, Josh mentioned a URL. We're going to go ahead and, and put this video up on YouTube when we're done, and we'll add links to everything down in the description, including we have some questions that are very specific to PointWise and some great videos that do a much better job of answering those by walking through the process in PointWise. We're going to put links to all of that in the description in that YouTube video so that you can click on those and, and see what we're talking about. Um, okay. All right. The next question is, I'm curious to know if PointWise has support for handling high order isoparametric meshes like those that could be used for spectral element methods. In addition to storing the mesh topology, additional information needs to be stored for element geometry. Um, really good question, uh, ending with, is this a current feature in PointWise or something that PointWise team is considering? So PointWise can generate high order meshes. We start with a linear mesh inside PointWise, and then we perform a process that we call degree elevation, where we actually insert the additional nodes um, on edges, faces, in interior to cells, anything that's on a surface we ensure is projected back onto the underlying geometry so that you have the maximum accuracy in resolving that geometry. Um, the high order points are equally spaced um, inside the elements using Lagrangian basis functions. And so that's going to be the, the key. So if you're using those, then you can use these elements and the points, the high order points that we create uh, directly. If not, you can take the high order elements and generate your own high order points and use those as well. So that's that question. Good question. Uh, question number four is, I was wondering if there is a strategy for placing T-Rex on a cube sitting on the ground. I occasionally have to model substations with transformers which act as heat sources. I need to apply a heat flux boundary condition and need to model inflation layers for all surfaces and these box shaped transformers that are sitting on the ground. Josh? Yeah, good. another good question. Uh, once you're ready to initialize the volume grid, under the boundary conditions tab, you can identify any surface that you want to have T-Rex extruded from. And to do that, what you're going to do is set up a new boundary condition, and then in the scene, you're going to select all the surfaces that you would like to be included in that boundary condition. Then once you're done selecting those domains, you'll simply check those into that boundary condition. Uh, and then in that boundary condition tab, there's a, a column type, and there's several different types. Uh, wall, there's angle, there's batch, adjacent grid. The one in particular that you're going to be using for, for extruding T-Rex boundary layers is a wall condition. Uh, once you've got those set up, uh, again, of course, any, any of those services will have T-Rex extruded from them, and they'll be subject to any uh, T-Rex criteria that you uh, put in the T-Rex tab, which is adjacent to the boundary conditions tab. So that's how you would um, have T-Rex extruded from any surface, all surfaces, what, you know, whatever you'd like. All right. Thank you, Josh. Uh, another question. Uh, and actually, before we get to this one, one did pop up in the Q&A window here. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and bookmark that one for in just a minute. Um, all right. So where do we see the future of meshing going? Uh, once we're able to generate grids for the required applications in a robust and automated manner, and adaptive grid refinement is used in an efficient manner, what other challenges do you see in terms of meshing? Another really good question. Um, 
For me, I, I see meshing heading towards more automation. That was already mentioned in, in the question, but I, I do see that's where meshing is heading and will continue to head, is basically taking the engineer out of the loop. Um, pulled from the CFD uh, Vision 2030 study, just making the meshing process invisible to the user, right? This is, this is where meshing is going. Um, some other technologies that are gonna enable this are things like solver agnostic grid adaptation, stuff that you know even PointWise is working on where you can generate a baseline mesh, but you don't necessarily know where the refinement needs to go or anything like that. And so one of the ideas is if you're gonna take the engineer out of the loop and his intuition, then you need something like a technology that does grid adaptation, um, and that's gonna enable that. So that's another big one, um, you know, even pushing forward into design optimization, remeshing. So automation, grid adaptation are two really key uh, technologies there moving forward. Some challenges are gonna be robustness. Even though uh, the question did state, you know, let's say robustness is taken care of, I, I still do think that's gonna be a challenge moving forward as we automate more and more um, particularly on the, the CAD side, CAD interoperability, working with multiple CAD formats. Everybody reads and writes CAD formats differently or prepares them in a different way. And specifically if CAD is not, or geometries are not, you know, built for, for the purpose of CFD. If they're, if they're built for some other purpose and are being used for CFD, you know, obviously that's, that's going to cause some issues and some robustness issues as well. Uh, and it's not a, a great way to enable automation. Really, we need to be thinking about generating uh, CAD for the purpose of CFD, and that will enable this downstream automation that we're talking about moving forward. So until that happens, robustness is, is obviously going to be a challenge that we have to face. Also in terms of grid quality, not just geometry, but grid quality. Different solvers have different quality metrics that they're sensitive to, and you know, different engineers have different comfort levels with quality metrics. You know, engineer A and engineer B may run you know, the solver in a different way, and engineer A may be more comfortable running something uh, that has lower quality than engineer B, and may be able to get a converged solution on something like that. Um, so there's a lot of variability even on the grid quality side. So that kind of plays into uh, this idea of robustness as well. Which kind of leads into the other question, uh, it, which is, I use ANSYS CFX as a solver, um, and I need to check orthogonality. Is there a quality parameter that corresponds to this metric uh, inside point-wise? Uh, Josh, you want to go ahead and take that one? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, the, for, for ANSYS meshing, the quality metric you want to look inside of point-wise is our non-orthogonality uh, metric. Uh, whenever you're building a, a, a structured grid or an unstructured grid, um, you can check that out prior to exporting that to ANSYS. Uh, and typically you want your non-orthogonality metric to be less than 85. Uh, that, that generally provides you the best um, grid whenever you move to, to the ANSYS meshing tool, or ANSYS Fluence, excuse me. Yeah, and for CFX specifically, um, the, CFX is a, is a vertex-centered code. And so the, the metrics Josh is talking about are you know, the cell-centered metrics that if you're using other ANSYS products, you'd be able to use those. Specific to kind of CFX, we have some new vertex-centered um, grid quality metrics that will be available in the next release of PointWise, and you'll be able to use those to look directly at the orthogonality that you see in, in tools like CFX or something like SU2 or Fun3, these vertex-centered codes. Um, so we've got you covered on the grid quality front. All right, Josh, uh, is it possible to create a boundary layer mesh using only TETS? Yes, absolutely. Uh, first, it starts with the surface mesh. And when you're building a surface mesh, you can use either the Delani uh, algorithm or you can use the advancing front algorithm. Those two algorithms will provide you with a tri-dominant surface mesh. Uh, and the next one you go to initialize the volume mesh, which you'd go to grid solve. Uh, and under the T-Rex tab, there's a subframe called cell types. Uh, and you would select the option for tets and surface pyramids. And what this will do, it will create, obviously, a tri-dominant surface mesh. Your boundary layer extrusions will be tri will be uh, tetrahedrals. And then it'll uh, extrude into an isotropic tetrahedral far field. Uh, and then you have your complete tet surface, tet boundary, and tet far field. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Another question. Can you explain the difference between solid modeling and fault tolerant meshing and when to use one or the other? Really good question. Uh, another question where we'll probably have video links uh, in the description when we throw this up on YouTube. But the difference between solid modeling and fault tolerant meshing is 
with solid modeling, you're focused on healing the geometry. Uh, the idea is that if you have, you know, gaps or cracks or holes or things like that on the surface, you're patching those either manually by creating filler surfaces and then adding them to the model assembly or by using the automated tools and automa automatic kind of surface healing using like a tolerance and that kind of thing through our solid modeling um, assembly. And so once you're done kind of assembling the model, the idea is that once you've healed it, on the geometry level, when you generate your surface mesh, and I'm talking kind of unstructured, um, when you generate your surface mesh, that surface mesh is guaranteed to be watertight as well. And it will mirror the topology of the geometry. And so that's another advantage of solid modeling is you can use the concept of, of models and what we call quilts, which are collections of you know, underlying trim surfaces. You can use that to define the surface mesh topology, where you're gonna be applying boundary conditions, basically capturing your engineering intent on the surface, and uh, once you have all of that, you can generate your surface mesh and it will mirror that. You'll get surface mesh entities on top of each of these surfaces. You'll get grid curves on the boundaries of those. And so you have this one-to-one -one correspondence in, in mesh and geometry when you do a pure solid modeling approach. Fault tolerant meshing, on the other hand, is if you've got some of these defects on the, on the CAD side, you're managing those at the grid level, meaning you're putting a mesh on kind of the raw geometry and you're healing holes and gaps and cracks and things like that by doing merging operations on the actual grid level. And one of the nice things is you can use these two, two approaches, the solid modeling and the fault tolerant meshing together. So you can use solid modeling to get you say 90% of the way, heal up most of your geometry, put a surface mesh on it and then go and heal uh, any remaining issues at the grid level using our grid merge techniques and fault tolerant meshing. And so that's kind of the difference between the two and and I always start with solid modeling. Um, it's get as far as I can. Most of the time you can get 100% of the way, uh, but sometimes if I'm spending a lot of time on it, I'll get myself, like I said, 90, 95% of the way and then I'll just resort to uh, doing fault tolerant for the remaining portion just to get my surface mesh on there so that I could start working on my volume. And one of the things you want to be weary of whenever you're doing fault tolerant meshing, if you have defects in the geometry, you want to be very weary of the spacing you use in, in the case of doing fault tolerant meshing, uh, because if the spacing, like for instance, boundary layers or curvature capturing, if the spacing gets on the order of those deficient or defects in the, in the geometry modeling, you could experience some kinks there. So there's some tricks you can play to get rid of that, but just be aware that you want your spacing uh, if you do see some issues, that, that could be one of the reasons on the fault tolerant meshing side. But we have plenty of tricks and tips that, and of course we can link videos when this is done to show you how to get past that. But if you notice that, then that could be one of the issues for that particular situation. Which kind of plays into the next question, which is, Josh, how do we avoid automatic uh, merging <laughs> of nodes? <laughs> Well, if you run into a situation where your nodes are being automatically merged, uh, one of the things you're going to check is your, your file tolerance. So if you go to file, there's a, 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 a subheading under file called properties, and there are, are, are a number of, of uh, tolerances, one of which is the nodes. So if you're having nodes that are automatically merged, the spacing between those nodes is going to be less than the tolerance there. So you simply want to decrease the tolerance to prevent that auto merging. Okay. All right, another question, uh, and we just have a couple left and then we'll bring it to a close. Uh, what exactly is the match boundary condition for T-Rex? So the match boundary condition for T-Rex, especially when coupled with push attributes, uh, is a way of specifying a surface where your volume boundary layer information will essentially be imprinted onto a particular domain or set of domains. The easiest way to describe this is think of like an aircraft with a symmetry domain. So half an aircraft and a symmetry domain. Uh, when you're growing layers off of the aircraft, you want them to match, basically imprint those boundary layers, on the boundary layer extrusion onto that symmetry domain. So you have a nice uh, matching between those two. And the way to do that is you take that symmetry domain and inside the T-Rex solver, you specify that as a match type uh, T-Rex boundary condition, and coupled with push attributes, that will take all of the layer information and push it, imprint it, onto anything that is specified as a match type. Now, another great example is just a pipe. So we have a, you know, a 3D pipe with an inlet and an outlet. Um, the inlet and outlet, you don't want to grow boundary layer elements off of those. You only want to grow them off of the pipe itself. So those end caps, those would be in a match condition with push attributes turned on, and T-Rex will push its growth attributes, the initial height, the number of layers, the growth rate, everything 
to those domains so that you have this nice uh, matching on those domains. So that is the match boundary condition for T-Rex. All right, we talked about grid quality, so we can go ahead and skip that, that one and head to the last question that we got, which is, what is the best way to learn point-wise? Um, and this is a really good question, especially now, uh, because there are a lot of different ways to learn point-wise, but I'll, I'll talk about the one that you can take advantage of right now, um, which is our online training platform just went live on April 1st. And our engineering services team spent over a year developing the content for this course. Uh, it's not just a direct port of our standard three-day course. Uh, for something that's on demand and online, it is interactive, there are exercises, there are videos, there's written content, and we highly recommend it. And for the entire month of April, we have made that class 100% free, the entire course. And you can access that at training.pointwise.com. Highly recommend you go take take that class. Um, if you need a temp key or anything like that for the remainder of the month, feel free to reach out. We're happy to help. Um, that is the best way that we know how to learn point-wise is to take a class. And the fact that that class is now online and on demand, you can take it at your own pace. Nothing beats it. We do have in-house training um, that we'll be offering as well. The, the latest class uh, was canceled because of everything going on, obviously. Um, but we do have more scheduled throughout the year. Those are in Fort Worth, Texas. We can also bring training classes to you. Um, additionally, we have a Tutorial Tuesday uh, playlist on YouTube. And every Tuesday for, I think now, the last five years, we have released a short two to three minute video talking about a specific feature or technique inside PointWise. So that, that playlist is massive. It's on YouTube. You can access it very easily by going to tutorialtuesday.video, just typing that in the URL uh, bar. It'll take you right to that, that playlist. We'll obviously leave links in the description below. That's a great way to learn about the features of PointWise. We have a solutions page on our website. We also have videos, more videos on our YouTube channel talking about how our clients are using our software, how we're using it um, through webinars and, and, and events like this. So there are a lot of late ways to learn. Um, the last thing I'll mention is our user manual is 100% online. It is searchable. You can access that from our website. So every feature and command in PointWise is documented. You can access that directly from the website. So a lot of different ways to learn PointWise, obviously. But definitely for the month of April, please go ahead and visit training.pointwise.com and just start taking the free training. Um, you've got nothing to lose. And uh, I, think you'll, I think you'll like it a lot. Be, so, be productive in this pandemic time, right? Yeah, right, exactly, exactly. Can okay. I throw something, well, can I throw yeah, something on the, 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 so, so the um, Tutorial Tuesdays, we also take suggestions. If you have something that you want to see in the Tutorial Tuesday format, please hit us up. Uh, we've done it before. We didn't get a whole lot of responses, but we are always looking for those. Uh, we want to make sure and put video content out there that you find useful. So um, hit us up with topics, and we'd be glad to do a tutorial Tuesday video over. Yep, we're always looking for topics. As you can imagine, after doing videos every Tuesday for five years, <laughs> you get you get to a point where You're it's time to, start soliciting, <laughs> yeah, yeah, time to start soliciting some feedback and, and getting some ideas. So please do uh, send us your ideas. We're happy to work those into the schedule. Um, but with that, we thank you all very much for, for attending our first live Q&A. Again, if you like it, let us know. We'll do more of these. Um, I think the questions we got were really good. Hopefully you enjoyed the, the answers and the content that we provided here for you. Um, if you do have any other questions, like I mentioned, email us at letstalk at pointwise.com, and we'll follow up with you after this. And like I said, this is going to go up on YouTube. Pass it around. We're going to have call-outs you know, all over the screen. Uh, that you can uh, you can click on. Uh, you'll have the, the the links in the description. You can click on take you to different content. So keep an eye out for that as well. But thank you all very much for your time, and uh, hopefully we'll see you in another one. All right, Josh. See you. We'll see you later. See you.